we are going to be talking about unbiased EN junctions today. And the first thing that I would like to talk about is the junction structure. So what I'm about to draw is very, very different than what you see in most textbooks. And we're gonna resolve to that shortly, but I think it's important that you guys understand how these things are physically made as well because it influences their behavior. So let's say that I have a substrate. of P-type material, okay. something doped to the order of 10 to the 15 acceptor atoms per cubic centimeter. If I wanted to form a PN junction, what I would have to do is what's called compensation doping. Do you guys talk about compensation doping in your 334 class at all? Okay. So compensation doping just means that I dope a region of previously doped material so much so that I overcome the amount of prior doping and add more doping to it. So I might have something like this. Not going to be a purely rectangular profile because of uh, an annealing process and all that kind of good stuff. It's going to have slightly rounded edges. And this region of the crystal would be what's called an N well. And again, let's say that my substrate was doped times 10 to the, uh, 10 to the 15 um, acceptor atoms per cubic centimeter. My N well needs to be. 10 to the 15 donor atoms per cubic centimeter to make that bit behave like in transit crystal. And then I have to go even past that to make it start behaving like N-type crystal, okay? The interface between that N-type region and that P-type substrate forms a PN junction. But this device isn't finished. And this is something that isn't reflected enough in my opinion in textbooks and things like that. We would also have to have metal contacts where this metal contact provides a connection to the end well, and it serves as the cathode for our device. And then this other metal contact over here serves as our connection to the P substrate, and it is the anode for the device. So in reality, we would have not only a PN junction, formed again at the interface between the annual region and the substrate. And this is actually going to be a three-dimensional junction because this is kind of like a tub sitting in the middle of a pool of P-type material, right? So if you put like a, think about if you dropped a bathtub or something like that inside a vat of liquid, it touches that interface on all sides. So it's actually a three-dimensional profile. And then we also have a very specific type of metal semiconductor junction that's being formed between this metal region and this end well. And then a second metal semiconductor junction 
between this metal region and the p-type substrate. I don't believe the textbook that we're using in this class, nor the textbook that we used uh, for the previous few years, had anything to do with metal semiconductor junctions at all, um, which I believe to be absolutely criminal because they are very, very important and understanding them is very, very useful. Uh, so I'm going to dedicate an entire day to talking about metal semiconductor junctions, which I think will be next Monday. Uh, these metal semiconductor junctions are what are going to be called ohmic contacts, meaning that they allow current to pass in both directions. Uh, but we're going to see next Monday that we can also form uh, rectifying contacts, which means we can make diodes just out of a piece of metal and a chunk of, chunk of semiconductor material as well. All right, so this is how you would go about forming a real PN junction. A simplified view, which is going to make our math a little bit easier, and it's going to behave roughly in the same way, would look something like this. So on the left-hand side, I'm going to have my anode terminal. Over here on the right-hand side, I have my cathode terminal. And here in the middle, I'm going to write the letter M. And what that M stands for is a metallurgical junction. Okay, That's a very specific type of junction. It's also called a step junction. And this is going to serve as x is equal to zero in our system. So before I fill out a couple other things, I want you guys to very, very, I want you to understand this is not how they are actually made. Okay, we're going to treat this as if we had a section of p-type material and a section of n-type material, and we somehow fuse them together does not remotely work that way at all. To make it work that way, we'd need to be in space. Um, how, how many of you are familiar with the concept of cold welding? So uh, when you're at a vacuum, if you have a chunk of steel and another chunk of steel and they touch, they fuse together, no heat applied or anything like that. That's cold welding. That's why you have to have all kinds of like fancy oxides and all that kind of stuff on any of the parts that you send up on uh, space shuttles and at the International Space Station and all that kind of good stuff. Because if you don't pay attention to the chemistry of the materials that you're using, things will fuse together and you can't tighten a bolt or anything like that because the tool becomes part of the bolt and vice versa. Okay. So on the left-hand side of this junction, that will be our neutral, region. And on the right hand side of the junction, we will we'll be our neutral N. So on the P side, I'm going to have several negatively charged acceptor ions, each of which will contribute one hole. So this little black circle is a hole. The circle with a minus sign in the middle of it would be representative of an ionized boron dopant or something like that. 
on the right hand side, I'm going to have positively charged ions. I'm going to attempt to stick with a convention. Positive will be red and negative will be blue, but I'm gonna go ahead and pre-apologize when I accidentally screw up. All of these positively charged ions come with a free electron. This guy might be an arsenic ion. So it's a dopant, excuse me, a uh, donor ion. Okay. So I can draw a similar diagram um, that shows the carrier concentrations as a function of position in this state where the two chunks of material have been fused together, okay? If you have questions about anything, by all means, stop me and ask them. Here's X is equal to zero. So since the left-hand side of my junction is the P-type, I should have a pretty high hole concentration where I'm going to say that this is P, P naught, which represents the hole concentration on the P side of the junction at thermal equilibrium, and it will be approximately equal to Na which is the number of acceptor atoms used to dope the P side. And on the inside of the junction where holes are the minority carriers, I should have a very low concentration level. So I'm gonna call this PN naught, and it'll be approximately equal to Ni squared over Nd based on the results of our first lecture. And I can draw my concentration levels for my electrons on both sides as well. So on the N side, my electron concentration, N and not will be approximately ND. And it should be very high. Because I've drawn more red donor atoms on the right hand side of my junction, that's why my concentration level is higher. And the piece up. I'm trying to make it as accurate as possible. And then here's my minority carrier concentration N P naught, which is approximately Ni squared over Na. So what I have right now are two concentration gradients, right? So if we look at the holes, we can see that across the neutral and excuse me, the neutral P region of the crystal, there are a whole heck of a lot of holes until we hit that metallurgical junction, at which point the hole concentration drops off very steeply. So because we have a difference in concentration levels across the crystal, we should expect that holes will diffuse from the left to the right.
And similarly, we have a very, very large number of electrons on the end side of the crystal and a relatively small number of free electrons on the P side of the crystal. So we should observe that we have electron diffusion occurring from right to left. So we have a bunch of electrons and holes moving towards each other. What do we expect to happen? Recombination, absolutely right. So effectively, we have a bunch of electrons at a high energy state and a bunch of a lack of electrons with a low energy state. The electrons want to move down to that lower energy state. And so we annihilate a lot of electron hole pairs. So redrawing again. Try to make these. Let's see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, Just for that, let me turn my ringer off. Count three, six, seven. 10, 10, 11, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 more. Something like this. Draw my little electrons real quick. All right, so recombination, uh, excuse me, recombination near our metallurgical junction has occurred. And so the size of our neutral N region and neutral P regions has gotten smaller. left with this space here in the middle that is completely devoid of free charge carriers. So there are no free electrons in the conduction band of the crystal or relatively close to no. Uh, there are also effectively no holes in the valence band of the crystal. And this region extends from X is equal to negative W P naught on the P side to X is equal to positive W N naught on the N side. And this total distance here, I'm gonna call W naught, which is the width of the depletion region 
or space charge layer at equilibrium or at an unbiased state. Okay. So in the crystal that I've drawn, there are more donor atoms over here on the right hand side than there are acceptor atoms on the left hand side. Why doesn't diffusion continue to occur until the whole thing effectively looks like an n type crystal? That's exactly right. There's going to be a barrier that's forming. Okay. The barrier is caused by these bound ionized acceptor and donor atoms. Okay. So over here on the right hand side of the junction, we have a relatively thin layer of positively charged ions with no free charge carriers. And over on the left hand side of the junction, we have a layer of bound negatively charged ions, again, with no free charge carriers. So what happens when I have a region of positive charge, where positive charge is accumulated and I have a region of negative charge? A capacitor as a fairly reasonable estimation of what's going on. It's actually pretty good. We're going to tie it back to that at the end of the class. From your, uh, shit, you guys may not even know this yet from your fields class, but if I have positive charge on one side, negative charge on the other, I've established an electric field. Right? So I should have an electric field E oriented from right to left in our crystal. And I'm going to say that the bound charge here on the N side of the crystal is QN. And the bound charge here on the P side of the crystal is QP. So, what does this electric field do? Electric fields cause carrier drift, right? So what happens to a hole that is trying to diffuse to the right? Okay, so let, let's, let's think about what's going on here exactly right now. I'm not gonna redraw the carrier concentrations because they're up here, but things are a little bit different now because in our depletion region, both of these carrier concentrations have effectively fallen to zero. Same thing on this side. So we have a region where it's really high and then it's practically nothing. And then a region where they go back up to being really high. So we should expect that our majority carriers, the holes, are still gonna want to diffuse to the right. But we have an electric field oriented in the direction opposite hole diffusion. So it's pushing any hole that tries to get close in the other direction. So it's keeping holes from diffusing. Similarly, we should see that our majority carriers here, electrons, want to diffuse from right to left, but our electric field is oriented from right to left. And we know that electrons move in the opposite direction to our field. So this electric field here keeps majority charge carriers from diffusing. And we reach an equilibrium state where the whole drift and the whole diffusion currents exactly cancel each other out. And the electron drift and the electron diffusion currents exactly cancel each other out. So no majority carriers can diffuse or drift across the junction because the two different things are equally pushing them in opposite directions. We might have some minority carriers moving back and forth across, right? Because 
we have a little bit of electrons here, not a whole hell of a lot, but a few electrons, there is a gradient. So electrons should be able to move into this region. And similarly, holes, the small amount of holes should be able to move over here. And so we're going to wind up seeing that we do have some very, very, very small amount of currents, but it's effectively just going to be noise because the levels are so low. Logan. Is that because our majorities are like, you know, orders of magnitude more? Exactly right. So if we if we start off with a relatively low acceptor doping of 10 to the 15, right? That means this concentration here is 10 to the 5 on, on the order of that. Okay, if this guy is 10 to the 17, 10 to the 18, this is a couple of hundred to a couple of thousand holes per cubic centimeter. So it's not enough to sustain any real observable amount of current. Um, if we had even a small bias voltage here, we'd see that it's on the order of like picoamperes. Okay, so it's practically nothing. And those diffusing holes and electrons of the minority carriers are going to recombine in that region anyway. All right, so we're not going to see a whole hell of a lot. Um, all right, so we have established that my uh, excuse me majority carriers reach an equilibrium condition such that J diffusion P plus J drift E is equal to zero and J diffusion N plus J drift. Uh, gosh, that doesn't look like an N at all. Is equal to zero. So this is what our unbiased Junction looks like. We have a neutral P region full of acceptor atoms and holes. Then we have the P side of our depletion region, which just has a bunch of negative charge stored. Then over here, we have the N side of our depletion region, which has a bunch of positive charge stored. And then we have our neutral N region. So overall, our crystal is still at equilibrium, right? There is no net positive charge or net negative charge or anything like that over the entirety of the crystal. Exactly as much positive charge is stored here as a negative charge is stored here, which establishes an electric field, which maintains that equilibrium position of no currents are flowing. Luke. Is the deplete region on the B side wired? Yes. I have drawn this in such a way that the depletion region on the P side is wider than the depletion region on the N side. Okay. The reason why I've done that is because the charge stored on the P side of the region and the charge stored on the N side of the region have to exactly balance each other out. And since there are more donor atoms on this side than acceptor atoms, we need a smaller overall volume to make the charges equal. So if the cross-sectional area is the same, then that means that these lengths are gonna be different if the doping concentrations are different. That's a good question. All right, so let's talk about the barrier potential or built-in voltage that occurs in this crystal, okay? So that electric field, let me write this down. Junction built in All right. So there are two different ways that we can think about this, but they both effectively come out to the exact same thing, all right? Um, if we have an electric field, that means we have some voltage per unit length. So some voltage drop across our depletion region. 
Another way to think about it is what uh, Logan was talking about. We have a capacitance. We have a, uh, so if we consider it to be a capacitor, we have capacitance, we have some amount of stored charge. What's keeping that charge separated is a potential difference, a voltage, right? So C is equal to Q over V, I think, or maybe it's V over Q. I don't remember off the top of my head, but capacitance, voltage, and charge are all related. So either way we look at it, we have some voltage drop across our um, depletion region of our crystal. Uh, its profile is going to look something like this. There's a voltage as a function of position. Let's put this guy right here to be X is equal to zero. This is increasing X. And this is the electric potential on the N side of the crystal. This is the electric potential on the P side of the crystal. And so the height of this is V naught, our barrier potential, which is simply Vn minus Vp. So this barrier potential is effectively making it hard for things to diffuse. So it's a portion of what the electric field is doing. Right. So if we want to understand what influences this built-in potential V naught, we need to look at our equilibrium current equation. So I'm going to use the current equation for holes, but it does not matter whether you use the one for holes or electrons, you're gonna get the exact same result, all right? So if J diffusion P plus J drift P is equal to zero, then that means negative Q VP times the derivative of the whole concentration with respect to distance plus Q UP our whole concentration times our electric field is equal to zero. I'm just substituting in the relationship that we came up with last class, where this guy on the left represents the diffusion of holes, and the guy on the right represents the drift of holes due to the electric field E. Um, so I can see that I have a common factor of Q on both sides, and so I can throw that away because I've just got zero on the other, or excuse me, I've got a common factor of Q. So if I divide both sides by Q, I'm just left with the, the dp times the derivative plus the up times p times e qubit goes away. And I can rearrange things slightly. And what I'll wind up getting is, uh, excuse me, mobility divided by diffusivity. multiplied by electric field is equal to one over my whole concentration times the derivative of my whole concentration. Now, electric field is related to voltage how? Yeah, okay. So uh, let me do this over here.
this is a relationship. You guys will get to this in your 313 class in probably two to three weeks. Uh, relating, or one of the two different ways to relate uh, electric field and uh, voltage. The other would be an integral based relationship that we're going to wind up using um, in a little bit. So if I substitute in this relationship and I recognize that mu p over dp is just Einstein's relationship, right? That's just going to be one over kbt over q, the way that this fraction is written. I wind up getting negative q over kbt times the derivative of voltage with respect to x is equal to one over my whole concentration times the derivative of my whole concentration with respect to x. And now I can see that I effectively have a common factor of one over dx on both sides. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to take the derivative So I'll have negative Q over KBT times the derivative from the potential on the P side of the crystal to the potential on the N side of the crystal, DV will be equal to the integral of the whole concentration on the P side of the crystal to the whole concentration on the end side of the crystal of one over P dP. This gives me negative Q over KBT dN minus VP or this bit right here is just my barrier, uh, me, barrier potential, V naught. And on the right hand side, I'm going to have natural log Pn minus the natural log Pp, which is the same as the natural log of Pn over Pp. And now I'm just going to simply rearrange some things. So I'll have V naught is equal to positive KBT over Q times the natural log of PP over Pn, so I want to be clear about what's happening here. I'm taking this negative sign and I'm applying it over here, which is going to give me negative ln Pn plus ln Pp, which is how I get Pp in the numerator, Pn in the denominator here. Now, Contra, uh, excuse me, the concentration of holes on the P side of the crystal is just Na, right? The contribution of holes on the N side of the crystal is Ni squared over Nd. So that's going to give me an Ni squared in the denominator of this fraction and an Nd up here in the numerator. When does this class end? 35. All right, so I have 35 minutes. Okay. okay. Um, worried I might not get through everything I want to get through. Today. It'll be okay. So this is our relationship for our built-in potential of our junction. 
and it depends on what type of semiconductor crystal we have by ni, and then it depends on the doping levels as well. Everything else is just that thermal voltage, which at 300 degrees Kelvin is about 26 millivolts. So um, let's do a quick example. Let's say that we have a PN junction in which NA is 10 to the 17 acceptor dopants per cubic centimeter, and D is 10 to the 16 acceptor dopants per cubic centimeter, and NI is 1.5 times 10 to the 10 electron hole pairs per cubic centimeter at a temperature of 300 K. And we wanna know what our built-in voltage is. It would simply be V naught is equal to 26 millivolts, which is my approximation for KBT over Q at 300 K times the natural log 10 to the 17 per cubic centimeter, 10 to the 16 per cubic centimeter. And then down here is gonna be 1.5 times 10 to the 10 per cubic centimeter squared, and I get 0 0.757 volts. For silicon, which in, uh, excuse me, an intrinsic carrier concentration of 1.5 times 10 to the 10 is reasonable-ish. Uh, so for silicon, we should expect to see numbers uh, ranging anywhere from kind of 0 0.6 volts to 0 0.9 volts is acceptable for a built-in voltage. Usually somewhere around 0 0.7 is what's generally given, uh, but obviously it depends on the doping concentration and all that kind of good stuff. Um, what if we increase the dopant concentration either of Na or Nd by a factor of 10? What would the change be in built-in voltage. Turns out it's going to be 60 millivolts. Does not matter what the dopant concentrations are, if you increase by a fact uh, increase one of them by a factor of 10, you wind up getting an increase in built-in voltage of 60 millivolts. I'm going to make you guys prove that in one of your homework problems. All right. Any questions regarding um, how we derive the built-in voltage, what it does, anything like that. It would be a fantastic theory type question for your exam. Built-in voltage is there to keep the system at equilibrium. Okay. Uh, so let's talk about charge distribution in the depletion region now. All right, so since the depletion region is devoid of free charge carriers, we observed that we had ionized donor and acceptor atoms um, causing charge to be stored on both sides of the PN junction. So what our charge distribution would look like is something like this.
So I'm going to call this rho. It's a volume charge distribution that depends on position. Um, let's see. There's all my positively charged ions stored on the N side. Here are my negatively charged ions stored on the P side. WN not. And as uh, Luke mentioned earlier, since the values of WN naught and WP naught are going to be different and depend on doping concentration levels, we should, excuse me, we should see that the carrier concentration profiles are a little bit different um, as well. So the side um, that's less heavily doped has a wider region. Okay. What should the total amount of charge stored on the N side of the region be? What do you think it's going to depend on? So I would argue the size of the region, right? So what would be the volume encapsulated here? It would be the length of it is WN naught, and then multiplied by the cross sectional area of the crystal, right? That's going to give you a box in which you're storing charge, all right? So A times WN naught is going to be a part of it, all right? That's giving us the volume. This is the volume charge density. So now we need to figure out the portion, like the number benefit, right? So what do these represent again? These circles with plus signs in them. The donor atoms, right? So if we have the size of the box and the number of donor atoms per unit volume, that gives us the number of positive charges we have there. Now we multiply by the charge of one electron or the charge of one proton to give us the total amount of charge, right? So this is the size of the box. This is the number of things we have in the box. And this is the charge associated with each of those things in the box. Seems fairly straightforward, right? We can do something similar over here. The magnitude of the charge on the P side of the junction is going to be Q A W P naught times N A. And these two amounts of charge or magnitudes have to be identical. Okay. Another thing that will be important here, so let's say that um, QN has to be equal to P and W naught, which is the total width of the junction, is just how much it extends into the P side of the crystal plus how much it extends into the N side. So, Before we move along from this, are we okay? Just reasonably okay. All right. I'm not sure how familiar you guys are with Poisson's equation yet, because I don't know how far along in the fields you are. So you might be taking this next bit on faith, uh, but it doesn't particularly matter anyway. Okay. So what Poisson's equation does is it relates the charge distribution to 
the electric field strength. Okay. And so we would find that the derivative of the electric field strength as a function of position is given by Q divided by epsilon, where epsilon is the permittivity of our semiconductor medium. multiplied by ND plus minus NA minus, where ND plus and NA minus are just the number of ionized donors. So effectively just ND and NA. We're, we're treating them as if they are all lost their bit in the, in the space charge layer. So they, they don't have a free charge carrier associated with it. And so from this guy, we're gonna wind up with the following spatial distribution, negative Q over epsilon times NA over the region, negative omega P naught is less than X is less than zero and positive Q over epsilon ND over the region from zero is less than X is less than WN naught, which looks like this. I'm gonna call this value down here. E naught, which is the maximum value of the field strength. So we're just gonna have effectively a linear relation. Okay. So a way to think about this is if we slide over, uh, have you guys learned Gauss's law or anything like that yet in your fields class? All right. Uh, so if we have a box that's encapsulating the charge as we move as a function of position, if we start from the edge of the depletion region on the P side, and we move our box over, it starts encapsulating a little bit of negative charge and then a little bit more negative charge and a little bit more negative charge and a little bit more negative charge until we hit X is equal to zero, at which point all of the negative charge is inside the box. As we keep going, we start getting positive charge because we're over onto the piece, excuse me, the inside of the crystal. And that's why the field starts decreasing because we're adding a little bit more positive charge and a little bit more positive charge as we move over. And so we get a profile that looks like this and it's linear because everything is well behaved. We have a rectangular box we're filling up with charge. And we're just making the box bigger and bigger and bigger to put more and more charge in it. Okay. So the key portion of this is figuring out what that value of E naught is, the maximum value of the electric field. Uh, it's going to be negative because the field is oriented from right to left. All right. So if we integrate our relationship, we'll find that we have this guy, right? So we're going to have the integral from zero to E naught. The E is equal to negative Q over epsilon and A from negative WP naught to zero dx. So that's us taking the integral over the left-hand portion. Or we could figure out by taking the integral over the right-hand portion where we'd be integrating from P naught to zero of positive Q over epsilon and D as we change in position from zero W and not whichever way that we go, we find 
that E naught is simply negative Q over epsilon and A WP naught or negative Q over epsilon and D omega N naught. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to relate this quantity to our barrier potential because we don't have that barrier potential without that field and we don't have that field without that barrier potential. So let me scroll up here real quick. We're going to use the integral based relationship here. So effectively multiply by dx on both sides and then take the integral of both sides is what we're about to do. And we'll find that negative V naught is equal to the integral of E of X DX when we integrate from negative omega P naught, excuse me, I keep saying omega, but it should be W, uh, W P naught to W N naught. And since our distribution is simple right triangles, we don't even really have to do any math here, right? It's gonna be one half base times height. We'll find that we have V naught is equal to negative one half E naught W naught. The total width of our depletion region, which is positive one half Q over epsilon and the WN naught or Q over epsilon NA WP naught. Either way works, but I'm going to do the electrons here. Um, since the same amount of charge is stored on both sides, meaning that ND times WN naught is exactly equal to NA times WP naught. And we know that WN naught plus WP naught is equal to the total width of the depletion region W naught. This allows us to say our built-in voltage can be expressed as one half Q over epsilon NA multiplied by ND over NA plus ND times the total width of our depletion region squared. And now, we can solve for the width of the depletion region. Oops, that went too far, I apologize. So our overall width of the depletion region becomes two epsilon over Q, NA plus ND, over NA times ND multiplied by V naught to the one half power. It's just simple algebraic manipulation. And we can actually write an expression for the amount or, or the size of the depletion region on the N side and the size of the depletion region on the P side now, um, because it's just based purely on the doping concentrations. Right, it's just going to be a simple ratio since we know that the charge stored on each side has to be the same. So we can say that WP naught is simply ND over NA plus ND times W naught. And we can say that WN naught 
is simply Na over Na plus Nd multiplied by W. Obviously, adding both of these guys together gives us just W. The last thing that we can do to manipulate this guy here, we can use the results to figure out what the actual total charge stored in the junction is. Um, so I'm going to have to scroll because I'm at the bottom of the page here. So finally, we have UJ. Our junction charge, which will be exactly equal to the magnitude of QN, which is exactly equal to the magnitude of QP, is A times Q and A multiplied by ND over NA plus ND. times W naught, which is two Q epsilon A squared and A N D over N A plus N D multiplied by V naught all to the one half. So, Let's take our semiconductor junction that we talked about previously, where Na is 10 to the 17, and D is 10 to the 16, and I is 1.5 times 10 to the 10 at D is equal to 300K. And we calculated that our built-in voltage was 0 0.757 volts. And let's figure out three things. A, the charge stored on the end side of the junction. B, the width of the depletion region. And C, the percentage of W naught that's on the end side. So in this case, we expect the majority of the depletion region to be on the end side of the crystal because NA is larger than ND, right? So let's look at this relationship right here. We obviously know what two is because it's a number. Uh, Q is just the elementary charge, 1.60218 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs, so that's well defined. Uh, I didn't tell you guys what the area is because I forgot. So let's make sure to put that in so I don't look like a total jackass. Uh, let's say that A in this case is 10 microns squared. NA and ND are both given to us. We calculated V naught. So the only thing that we really have any question about is the permittivity of um, silicon, which is a material constant, right? So the permittivity of silicon is 11.7 times the permittivity of free space. So that will be 11.7 times 8.854 times 10 to the negative 14 farads per centimeter. 
And when we put this guy into our equation to see what's happening here, let's talk about the unit of pair. Uh, this might be the first time that you guys have thought about the unit since I asked you about it way back in circuits one. Okay. So a farad is an amp second per volt. What's an amp second? A coulomb, right. So this is just coulombs per volt, okay? So in our equation, we're gonna have this big ugly thing here. Two times 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs times 11.7, 8.854 times 10 to the negative 14 coulombs per volt. Let me rewrite that for uh, my area of 10 Micron squared is the same as 10 times 10 to the minus six centimeters squared. I have to square that guy. Then I'm gonna have 10 to the 17 per centimeter cubed times 10 to the 16 per centimeter cubed. And when I add these guys together, that's just gonna look like 1.1 times 10 to the 17. Is everybody okay with that? So 10 to the 17 plus 10 to the 16 is 10 to the 17 plus 0.1 times 10 to the 17 or 1.1 times 10 to the 17. And then 0 0.757 volts. I wind up taking the square root of this guy. And I get 4.780 times 10 to the negative 15 coulombs of charge stored on the inside of my junction. So, Kaylee. How much charge is stored on the P side of my junction? Correct, the exact same amount. For part B, I just want to figure out what W naught is. So I'm gonna write down my equation again, since it's on the other page. Two epsilon over Q, Na plus Nd over Na times Nd times V naught to the one half power. We know what all of those quantities should be. So I'm gonna go ahead and jump to the answer real quick because I'm running low on time. Uh, one, excuse me, three point, or dang it, 328.145 Newton meters nanometers. So the width of the depletion region is always going to be pretty small, in the order of microns at the absolute maximum. Okay. For part C, how much of it extends into the end side? So we know that WN naught is simply an A over an A plus ND times W naught, which is 0 0.909 W naught. Therefore, 90.9% of W naught is on end side of the junction. So we would typically call this a one-sided junction because the overwhelming majority of it extends onto one side. Uh, for a one-sided junction, we can actually approximate the built-in voltage pretty easily. So worst case scenario, for a one-sided junction would be that, let's say the P side 
has a heavy doping and through some sort of accident, the end side were actually intrinsic crystals. So that we would wind up having thermal voltage times a natural log of uh, Na times Ni over Ni squared. So the worst case scenario approximation is just gonna be instead of Na times Nd over Ni squared, it's just gonna be the doped, the heavily doped bit divided by Ni gives you a pretty reasonable approximation of how it's gonna be. And we can see here that a difference in concentration levels of only a factor in 10 is enough to very, very heavily skew our crystal to be a one-sided junction. Okay, okay. Uh, the last thing that I want to talk about, and I think I can cover it in four minutes, there is an example problem, but we won't do it, is uh, the junction capacitance. All right, so as Logan mentioned earlier, when I was asking questions about us having stored charge and all that kind of good stuff, um, we can treat our PN junction as a capacitor, okay? We have charge separated and a voltage drop that occurs across our device, all right? So we have a capacitor. We have a parallel plate capacitor, if I can scroll up here, not going to make you guys redraw this or anything like that. If this is assumed to be a rectangular or a cylindrical or anything, um, cross section, right? We have one plate right here at the interface or, or at uh, WN naught, and we have another plate right here at negative WP naught. So the distance between the plates is just the width of the depletion rate. So for a parallel plate capacitor, C is equal to epsilon, the permittivity, multiplied by A, the cross-sectional area, divided by D, the distance between the plates. So our unbiased junction capacitance, CJ naught, is just epsilon A divided by W naught. Which is Q epsilon A squared divided by two NA times ND divided by NA plus ND times a factor of one over V naught and this whole thing is square root. So by itself, the tuning capacitance isn't particularly useful. And the reason why I say that is because this value is only true when it's not connected, right? As soon as we apply a voltage across it, what we're gonna find is that we start screwing around with the barrier potential. And so instead of having just one over V naught, we're gonna have one over V naught plus some reverse bias voltage or minus some forward voltage. But what's super interesting about that is that means that this guy is a voltage dependent variable capacitor. So we can make um, RLC circuits using PN junctions as a form of variable capacitors, which is exactly how old school analog radios used to tune to different frequencies. It's just a variable capacitor. When you change that knob, it's changing the space between the plates and lets you go from the lower portion of the FM band to the upper portion of the FM band, or same thing for the AM band. So very, very useful in radio frequency applications, the variable capacitor or varactor diode as it's called. All right, uh, it's 145, so I'm going to shut up. Uh, we'll see you guys on Wednesday.